Good day everyone. Here I am today on the beach of the River Medway in Kent. I used to play here 50 years ago when I was 10. Gee, I had some wonderful times searching for treasure. One day when I was playing here, a little girl came along. She was an orphan. She told me that she'd been playing here on this very beach for 200 years. I sat and listened to her stories. Then together we walked around the beach and we collected up all the driftwood and we made a boat. And we sat on the boat and we pretended that we were gonna sail all the way across to the other side of the world, to a land called Australia. It was a wonderful story she told me. I always remembered that story. And so that's the film that you're gonna to see today. I do hope you enjoy it. Thank you for watching. Chatham Dockyard, 1806. I can't smell anything, said 12-year-old Annabelle as she sniffed under her armpits. Who cares anyway? I've not washed for a month. Annabelle looked down at her clothes. My goodness, didn't she look a mess? Taking hold of an old rag, Annabelle wiped the cobwebs from the window and gazed at her reflection and smiled. Just like old times, she said, when I was the chimney sweep. She spat onto the cloth and proceeded to clean her face. Annabelle was tired. She had spent the entire day drawing etchings onto the layers of coal dust that covered the walls of her makeshift home. Taking a step back, she began to admire her own handiwork. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, if I do say so myself. Frogs eating pigs, toads wearing clothes, ships on the high seas, castles, horses, fantastic, great. That's enough drawing for today. The day was coming to a close and the long evening shadows had begun to creep across Annabelle's room. Suppose I should get ready for bed now. Annabelle grabbed hold of an old scrubbing brush and she began to painfully rake it through her hair. A lump swelled in her throat as a tear made its way down her cheek. I'll be all right. For goodness sake, just buck yourself up and get on with it. Tomorrow's another day. Home for Annabelle was a small derelict stone coal shed and it had been built around the 16th century and the dwelling had been forgotten in time and lay secretly hidden between several huge timber workshops at the Chatham Dockyard in Kent. The sheds were now falling into disrepair and generations of spiders and insects ambled freely among the rusting rat traps and broken harnesses and all the other rubbish that filled the room. And in the centre was a huge wooden bench and it was covered from end to end with cobwebs and dirt. Annabelle had cleared a small space in the centre and that was her bed. Annabelle clambered onto the table and slid under some sacks and curled into a ball. Darn blankets, said Annabelle angrily. They're as itchy as a head full of lice. She stretched down, tucked some sacking under her toes so that the spiders and creepy crawlies couldn't get in and she made ready for sleep. I must say that I like the sketch that you did of Upner Castle today. Thanks, Mum. I sketched it especially for you. Yes, dear. I like the sketch that you did of the tall ships today. Thanks, Dad. I drew them especially for you. Did you like the sails? But there was no answer.
Annabelle was becoming tired and her eyelids had begun to droop. Faintly she could hear the tall ships creaking in the nearby docks. Maybe they were rocking themselves to sleep. I'll sail away in one of those tall ships, she said one day. Night night mum, night night dad, love you. But there was no answer. The night sky began to settle over the coal shed as the local barn owl kept watch over Annabelle from above. Outside, the rats and mice swung like trapeze artists from broken wagon wheels and barrels and other pieces of antiquated junk that surrounded the shed. Breakfast. Morning arrived and the sun was peering through the grimy window and onto Annabelle's sleeping head. Her hair sp sparkled like strands of tarnished gold. Slowly her eyes opened and she gazed upon the cobwebs. Oh dear, I better check for spiders, said Annabelle quickly to herself while throwing off the sacks and jumping to her feet. And a lump swelled in her chest and in her throat and goosebumps ran down her arms and the hair on the back of her neck stood up. No spiders today, thank goodness, said Annabelle bravely to herself. Now what will you have for breakfast? Mmm, smoked kippers and toast please mum. We've only got bread today love. Thanks, that'll do fine, said Annabelle. But all the while she was actually talking to herself. Little by little, she nibbled into the green mouldy bread and gazed at her collection of chalk fossils on the window ledge. She began to think back. It had only been a month before and she'd been living happily at home with her parents in the South East Kentish town of Dover in England. The family had lived contently in a disused fishing hut that overlooked the seashore. They ate fresh bread daily, fish when they could catch it, and on Sundays, Annabelle's dad would trap rabbit and they would eat it for lunch. The whole family worked. Annabelle swept chimneys at posh people's houses, and her mum and dad, they excavated chalk from the labyrinth of tunnels that run deep beneath the Dover Castle. Her dad would load the chalk pieces into the baskets and her mum, her job was to lead the donkeys that carried the baskets full of chalk out from the tunnels and out into the daylight. If Annabelle was lucky, sometimes her parents would bring home chalk fossils. Some were shaped like leaves and others like seashells. And they were all millions of years old. Annabelle had displayed them neatly on an old barrel that stood in the corner of the hut. One day, Annabelle arrived home from work and things would never be the same again. A well-dressed gentleman stood at her door and told her that her parents had been killed in an accident at work. Poor Annabelle, she was so distraught. She sobbed all night and the following day and the day after that. In those days, children that had been orphaned were sent to live in the workhouse. That was a terrible place. Children worked all day for a bowl of porridge and they had no one whom to share their love. Sometimes a wooden cane would bite unexpectedly into the back of their legs and Annabelle was definitely not going there. So one night, wearing only the clothes on her back, and carrying her collection of chalk fossils wrapped carefully in a cloth, she secretly stowed away on a small ship that was bound for Chatham Dockyard in North Kent. After breakfast, so Annabelle now came back to the present and stopped thinking about her life as it used to be. She finished eating her mouldy bread and home for her now was the coal shed. Now what will I do today, she asked herself. Well, first, I need to get a haircut. She picked up a knife that had been laying on the windowsill. Hmm, how do I do a haircut? Annabelle asked herself. She didn't have a mirror, 
and it was too bright to see her reflection in the window. So gently grabbing hold of her long fringe, she carefully hacked away at her hair with a blunt serrated knife and strands of gold tangled hair fell to the floor. And within half an hour, all that remained were short little matted tufts of hair all over her head. Not a bad job, thanks, Barbara, she said to herself. Now, what else have I got to do today? I'll have to go and find some bread. And I need a new jacket. Watch that no one sees you, my love. OK, see you later. Love you, Mum. Annabelle liked talking to herself. It helped. Carefully, she opened the door of the coal shed and Annabelle peered out. No one was about and soon she found herself walking along the edge of the dock. She sniffed in the fresh moist air, breathed in deeply and she began to relax and flocks of seagulls squawked above her head. Huge sailing ships, they creaked softly in the docks. Maybe they were saying good morning to each other. Their masts strewn with thousands of ropes stretched right up into the low clouds and dozens of men were going about their work and doing their daily jobs. Nails were being hammered into timber and one man was shouting at a horse that had nearly backed the cart over the dockyard wall and into the river. Men were singing, arguing and preparing for their daily duties and the noise soon became deafening. What are you doing, Sonny? shouted a man to Annabelle above the hullabaloo. I'm just bringing my daddy's lunch. He left it in the scullery. With that, Annabelle left and continued on her way. Doubling back through a multitude of workshops and outbuildings, she found herself round the back of the navvy. And wading through the mess of rotting rubbish, two apple cores and the end crust of some green mouldy bread were today's fine. Wow, lucky me. Now, where do you fancy to go today with all this fine food, said Annabelle, conversing with herself. Think I'll jog along the water's edge towards Rochester. Rochester is a historical town nestled on the banks of the wide River Medway in Kent. It has its own Norman castle built in 1088 out of stone and a cathedral just as old. Shops and houses are dotted along the main street which stretched for several kilometres along the river's edge. A breath of fresh air. Annabelle started jogging along the shoreline, then jumping from one tidal puddle to the next and singing as she went. It was fun. She looked across the wide open river to the small village of Upna, which was nestled on the other bank. It had its own castle built in the 1500s and several small houses as well. Strange, thought Annabelle, as she studied the castle grounds. Why on earth would someone hang a weird pointed hat with stars on it and brightly coloured dress on a washing line that stretched from one cannon to the other? They must be mad. Escapees from the madhouse, I bet, said Annabelle to herself. Annabelle continued upstream in the direction of Rochester, passing small houses, taverns and the occasional shop that lay further back from the shoreline. Hmm, not the best haircut in the world. Suppose I'd better get a comb next time, she thought, as she gazed into one of the puddles. Time for lunch. Wash your hands, dear, said Annabelle, talking to herself, while she was swishing her hands in the muddy waters. Annabelle sat on the grass-covered river bank and gazed further upstream towards the small town of Strood. Barges and boats of all description travelled past and for just a second or two she forgot all her worries and her mum and dad too. Hmm, only two apple cores and some crust, sighed Annabelle sadly. Twelve-year-old Annabelle put her hand in her lap and she began to cry. Mum and Dad, please come back, I miss you. And the white seagulls flapped their wings and squawked above Annabelle's head 
and Annabelle looked up into the sky to watch them. If anyone's up there listening, she said as she peered deep into the sky, I do need some help. Annabelle peeled the green mould from her bread and threw the small pieces to the seagulls. They fought and squabbled like hungry children. Enjoy lunch, my friends. Annabelle ate the remainder of the bread. Wow, what's that? Annabelle heard a whimpering sound. Looking out towards the river, she caught sight of a sack that appeared to be dancing in the mud and the tide was slowly coming in. My goodness me, she thought, what on earth could it be? Ever so carefully, she waded through the sinking river mud until she reached the sack. It's much too heavy to lift, she said, while pulling at the rope that secured the bundle. Squealing and faint yelps could be heard coming from within. The whole sack started to jiggle again. Annabelle tried desperately to untie the knot. It was no use. Her tiny fingers were too weak. And the water's edge, was, being only yards away, was creeping slowly towards her with the incoming tide. Wait, wait, I'll be back, she yelled anxiously to the now thrashing bag as she ran back through the mud like a charging bull. Clusters of boats were rested on the muddy shoreline. A man could be seen sweeping the deck on one of the large Thames barges. Have you got a knife, shouted Annabelle in haste. Mr Jan Featherstone, if you don't mind, where are your manners, son? Sorry, sir. There is a sack in the river and I need to get it before the tide comes in, pleaded an apologetic Annabelle. Mr Featherstone looked at Annabelle, head to toe she was covered in mud. Her face, well, her face was covered in coal dust that remained from yesterday's artwork and she stank to high heavens. Mrs Featherstone was there too. She had been below deck cleaning and had come upstairs to see what all the commotion was about. Mrs, I need to get the sack from the river, pleaded Annabelle. You won't need the sack, son. It will be all dirty and covered in mud. We have some clothes here for you, if that's what you need it for, replied Mrs Featherstone sweetly. No, 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 I'm not going to wear it, said Annabelle politely. Is it OK if I borrow this? With that, Annabelle picked up the knife that had been lying on the riverbank next to the boat. I'll return it in a minute, she called, and she ran off. Like the wind, she flew down the riverbank and into the mud. Her bare feet bled as small stones ripped into her skin and the water's edge had begun to lap up against the sack. No, no, cried Annabelle, wait, wait. And quickly she jammed the knife under the rope and ripped it and the strands fell away and frantically she unfastened the sack. My beauties, my beauty, she said when she saw the bag full of puppies. Annabelle bent down and picked up two of the puppies by the scrap of their necks. They were covered in thick mud and their tongues were licking at her and their tails were wagging faster than anyone had ever seen before. Wait, wait, I'll be back, she called to the other puppies in the sack. And she waded back through the mud to the shoreline and then placed the puppies safely on the shore. Stay, I said stay and don't you move said Annabelle as she lectured the excited puppies. Then flying through the mud, she returned back to the sack and bending over, she peered in. There were about half a dozen or so different types of puppies, but none of them were moving. Sadly, they had all died some time ago. Oh dear, those poor puppies, said Annabelle, as she began to cry. Yelp, yelp, the puppies on the shoreline were calling to her. Annabelle, using all her energy, rang back to the two fluffy little bundles. They were so happy to see her. Soon they licked Annabelle's face until it was totally clean. Look what I found. What's all this then? asked Mr and Mrs Featherstone. They'd walked along the river's edge and were concerned. Annabelle told them all about the puppies in the sack. She then handed them back the knife. Thank you, she said politely. Mr and Mrs Featherstone were kind people. They were magical people too. They always helped the poor, but Annabelle didn't know that yet. They handed Annabelle a hessian bag that had been tied up with twine. There are a few things in there for you, Sonny. Thank you so much, said Annabelle, as she greatly received the package. If you don't mind me saying, sir, you have a strange name, Jan. 
That's a girl's name. No, it's actually pronounced Jan. It's Norwegian, said Mr. Featherston, but you can call me Jan. My wife is called Agatha. Annabelle waved goodbye as she walked home in the direction of Chatham Dockyard. Thank you so much for your help. And the little puppies followed closely behind her and their small tails wagging all the way. Soon Annabelle was home in the coal shed at Chatham Dockyard. Picking up the old scrubbing brush, she began to brush the puppies. Clearly the canines weren't related. The girl dog had white fur with the odd brown patch and the boy dog was much larger and mainly white. He sported a black patch over each eye and he had black floppy ears. Annabelle continued to brush their puppies until their fur shone. Time for me to open my parcel, she said while talking to the puppies. Now what have we here? It was just like Christmas. In fact, it was better than any Christmas she'd ever had. There were two jumpers, two pairs of breeches, two pairs of shoes, a cap, some boiled sweets, a toy boat, a carved wooden soldier, and they were all eagerly unpacked. Don't go much on the toy soldier or the boat, said Annabelle, as she talked to the dogs, but the rest is fantastic. Annabelle looked down at her arms and she was filthy. Not the best look for trying on new clothes, she told the puppies as they watched her with interest. Now you stay here, my beauties. I'm going for a bath. Be very quiet and don't you move. Then the dockyard workers had all gone home by now. Annabelle knew it would be safe to go outside. Wedging the door shut behind her so that the dogs couldn't get out, she left and made her way along the dockyard wall to the docks. Slowly down a mooring rope and into the river, she slid. The water was freezing, even though it was spring. Her clothes stuck to her like barnacles at the bottom of a ship. After washing her face and arms, she dunked her head into the water, rubbing as hard as she could. That's better, said Annabelle, as she clambered back up the rope and shook her wet head. With that, she ran home. The puppies greeted her at the door. Hello, my sweeties. Annabelle bent over and hugged the puppies and she gave them some bread and eagerly they ate it. Annabelle tried on all her new boy clothes and looked at her reflection in the window. Wow, she said excitedly, new clothes at last. Life had turned a corner for Annabelle. Now she had two friends. What will I name you? You, boy dog, well you can be Jan. And you, my sweetie, you will be Agatha. She named them after Mr and Mrs Featherstone. They were lucky puppies to have found someone as kind and as loving as Annabelle. Now you two, you watch and learn. I'm going to teach you how to draw. And don't either of you move because you are my models. The puppies sat there with their heads turned to one side as if to pose. They'd never seen such madness in their short life. Cleverly, Annabelle etched the image of the two little friends onto the wall. She pictured them sitting on the deck of a tall sailing ship. One day, she said, we'll sail away in one of those tall ships to the other side of the world. We'll walk around upside down and we'll see cuddly bears that live in trees and jumping animals with big tails. Now the puppies knew she was totally mad. Bedtime was a lot nicer for Annabelle. She had someone to talk to and had two hot water bottles to cuddle. Time passes. The months flew by and before Annabelle knew it, the puppies had become dogs. She had a set routine for Jan and Agatha. It went as follows. Brush dogs each morning, two walks a day, bath twice a week, double cuddles on Sundays, teach tricks and the English language from a book on Mondays and Fridays. Annabelle became much happier with her life. Morning walks along the shoreline were always enjoyable. And life across the river at Upner Castle hadn't changed. Unusual washing was still hanging on the strange clothesline that swung in the breeze on windy days. Maniacs them lot over there at Upner, said Annabelle, talking to dogs. 
He wears a white pointed hat with red dots and stars, and she's just as bad. She wears a long orange dress with white dots. They must have escaped from the madhouse. Change is in the wind. It was one warm morning in September. Annabelle and the dogs were enjoying their usual walk. Hmm, thought Annabelle, I think someone's following me. Bending down as if to pick a stone out from between her toes, she glanced over her shoulder, but no one was there. Every day that week, Annabelle felt uneasy, as if someone was watching her. Then one day, upon arriving home, Annabelle spotted an old hag standing in her doorway. Gore blimey, I've never seen anything quite like her before, have you? whispered Annabelle to the dogs. The dogs shook their head. They sniffed into the air. No. Upon close inspection, the woman's nose was seen to be long and pointy, and a large healthy wart flourished on the left nostril. The remainder of the hag's face was worse. It resembled an old tune up toffee that had been spat out onto the ground and now was covered in grit. Her face was framed with a mop of matted brown hair and a white bonnet sat upon her head. To be kind, her dress wasn't quite as bad as far as dresses go. It had probably seen six previous owners. And to finish off her appearance, a white apron stained with red clung to her bulging waistline. Come with me, me darling, crackled the old hag while rubbing her witch-like nose. No thanks, my mum will be home soon, said Annabelle, using her soft-natured sweet voice. The workhouse is the place for you, the hag continued. No, my dad won't let me go. You've got no mum or dad, you're coming with us. With that, the old hag grabbed hold of Annabelle by her ear. You can come out now, Ted. Ted was a man who could have perhaps have been the old woman's husband. He'd been hiding behind the rubbish outside the shed. In his hand, he held two thick brown leather dog collars. Quickly, he buckled them around Jan and Agatha's necks. Poor Agatha, she looked so sad. Jan was made of sterner stuff and he tried to bite the nasty Mr. Ted. These dogs will make us lots of money, exclaimed Mr. Ted confidently. The old hag steered Annabelle in the direction of the coal shed. You've got two minutes to collect your meagre belongings and then we're gone. Annabelle collected her clothes and her beloved chalk fossils and placed them in the bag that Mr. and Mrs. Featherston had given her. Next thing she knew, she was being dragged again by the ear and into the waiting cart. It was filled with other children. Beside Annabelle was another cart filled with bedraggled dogs and each in its own cage. Most had great chunks missing from their ears and two were blinded in their eyes. Jan and Agatha were in there too. They had been put in a cage and were now whining and licking at the bars. Annabelle spoke to the other children, wanting to know if they knew what would happen to her dogs. They'll be going to the dog sale, said an older boy. He was the old hag's son. It's held once a month at the bull. Annabelle inquired softly, will I get my dogs back? No chance, said the older boy as he laughed. They'll be sold to some rich person from London or better still, they'll be put in a pie and baked in a hot oven. They'll taste nice with brown sauce or gravy. Annabelle cried. Poor Annabelle. With that, both carts pulled away in opposite directions. Jan and Agatha, they howled. Then a massive fight broke out among all the dogs that were caged. <laughs> Savagely, they all bit into the bars. <laughs> Jan and Agatha cowered onto the floor. They were safe in their cage at present. Annabelle couldn't bear to watch any longer. And the horse and cart that were carrying her and the other children wound its way along the wharf and out of the dockyard gate. At the gate, a sign was pinned to the adjoining wall, dog sale, Saturday night, 9 p.m. at the Bull. All welcome. Annabelle started to cry. 
None of the other children in the cart were happy. They didn't want to go to the workhouse either. It would be a terrible life for them. What's your name? asked the 12 year old scrawny boy. Andy, replied Annabelle, who was pretending to be a boy. What's yours? Andrew, I'm Andy too. We're not going to the workhouse, are we? sobbed Annabelle. No, not on your Nelly we're not, said Andrew. And what about my poor dogs? whimpered Annabelle. I know where the Ball Hotel in Rochester is, said Andrew reassuringly. We will rescue them if we can. The two children, who had quickly become friends, then hatched a plan as the cart trundled along the cobble street towards Rochester. Once we get as far as Rochester Bridge, we'll jump out and into the water's edge, said Andrew bravely. And so it was. The evening shadows had grown long and the old hag with her son beside her had fallen asleep and the woman's hands loosely held onto the reins. The old horse had travelled the same journey twice a week for a long, long time and it knew exactly where it was going and the other children were falling asleep too. Then, splash, splash, Andrew and Annabel had jumped into the river. Annabelle jumped with her bag with all her belongings in it close to her chest and looking back they saw that no one had seen them. They swam and swam until they could swim no longer and soon the river mud squelched beneath their toes and slowly they dragged themselves out of the water and onto the muddy river bank. There they lay flat on their backs and gazing up to the stars. Do you think the stars would look the same down under? asked Annabelle solemnly. Where and what on earth is down under, inquired Andrew, who by now was dumbfounded and sitting bolt upright in the mud. Annabelle spoke all about Australia, the land down under, and how she was going there one day. Why are we talking about this now, asked Andrew impatiently. Well, I miss my mum and dad. I wish they were here now too, Annabelle sobbed. We were going to Australia next year to live and have land with horses and cattle, and I want my mum and dad to come back. Andrew answered solemnly, he missed his parents too. But we won't get to Australia sitting here in the mud, will we? Let's get a move on, said Andrew. They had come ashore at the foot of Rochester Castle and were now gazing up at the massive high stone curtain wall that surrounded it. Look, said Annabelle excitedly, there's a hole in the wall. Together they climbed over the rocks, boulders and rubble and scrambled their way through and soon they were standing in the castle grounds. Their body was soaking wet and they were shivering. The castle was built in 1088 and had the highest keep, or is otherwise called a stronghold, in England and it stands at 113 foot tall, which is 34 metres. It stood amid acres of overgrown land and was surrounded by a high wall. It was privately owned, but its only inhabitants were thousands of pigeons. The Ball Hotel was just two minutes walk away. Home in the castle. We'll sleep atop of the castle in one of those turrets, said Andrew confidently, who by now was straining his neck and pointing to the top of the moonlit castle. Climbing across a wooden barricade and into the castle keep, they crept. Faint light glistened through the small peepholes in the castle wall. Do you think there are any ghosts? Whispered Annabelle, or spiders even? Andrew replied confidently, of course not. Who would want to live in a cold hole like this? He didn't like spiders or ghosts, or for that matter, anything that crept silently at night. We'll be all right, come on, said Andrew. We'll soon be at the top. Annabelle and Andrew could just see only where they were going and feeling their way along the rocky walls, eventually they reached a spiral staircase. Look, said Annabelle, there's two flints and a candle. Andrew picked up the flints and struck them together several times to produce a spark and soon the candles were lit. Little by little, they felt their way up the spiral staircase. Even with the help from the candle, it was almost impossible to see where they were going. Annabelle continued to trip and graze the knees on the stone steps. They reached the top. See, I told you, no spiders or ghosts, announced Andrew triumphantly. Annabelle and Andrew gazed out into the moonlit sky. 
It's amazing, shouted Annabel with excitement in her voice. And she was pointing to this huge spire of Rochester Cathedral. It was lit by moonlight. Andrew was impressed too. He watched quietly with interest as dozens of quaint houses spewed smoke out from the chimneys into the night sky. Slowly, they walked around the top of the castle to the other side. Look down there, shouted Andrew triumphantly. There is Rochester Bridge that we swam from. Annabel could see carriage lamps on the bridge. Yes, we are lucky to be here. Not like all those poor children who are on their way to the workhouse. Do you think that we will be missed yet? asked Annabel. With a touch of bravado, because it was beginning to hit home just what they'd done, Andrew replied, never find us here. Then trying to change the subject, he asked, what's in the bag then? Bits and bobs, some chalk fossils and rocks, replied Annabel proudly. My mum and dad gave them to me. Everything went quiet for a while. Then Annabel and Andrew exchanged their stories. So you see, I'm not a boy, said Annabel. Thought you had a bit of a squeaky voice for a boy, continued Andrew. Your face is a bit girly too. Andrew explained how he had lived alone too, and his parents had died of fever just a few months before. The wind began to howl around the top of the castle and ghost-like noises groaned through the deep turret holes in the castle walls. Annabel and Andrew were quite frightened. Crouching on the floor, they found some rotting sacks. These would have to do as seats, said Annabel, as she folded the hessian into two piles. I miss my poor dogs. They are in cages somewhere right now, and I hope they've been fed. Jan likes a brush each night before he goes to bed, and Agatha, well, she won't sleep unless she's with me in bed. Annabel began to cry, and somehow she fell asleep. Morning came, and Annabel was woken to the sound of thousands of pigeons warbling and flying about. We'll have to make a plan for my dogs, said Annabel, as she stretched to wake herself. Breakfast first, replied Andrew. Andrew hadn't slept all night, so he'd been out early and scrounged some bread and the remains of two pig's trotters. Annabel hadn't eaten meat for nearly two months. She studied the trotters and could see the bite marks from the previous owner, but she didn't care. They tasted good. It was Friday and tomorrow was the day of the dog sale. What would they do, thought Annabel. Annabel and Andrew decided to go and seek out the Bull Hotel in Rochester High Street. It was just along the road and a busy place. All manner of people had gathered outside the hotel. Some you could smell six yards downwind. Others were well dressed and had arrived in carriages. They were probably en route to London. Annabel and Andrew walked through the hotel massive archway entrance passing carriages and carts as they went. Soon they reached the saloon bar. Peering in through the window, they could see dozens of people all seated. They were all listening to a man playing a violin. Well, they won't be having the dog sale in here, will they? Said Andrew confidently. Annabelle's lips were trembling. Let's go round the back to the courtyard, said Annabelle. A dog could be heard whining. The sound was coming from a stable. Andrew peered in over the half door. He was a cute small dog, but sadly it wasn't Jan or Agatha. The dog seemed quite happy and was well fed. At the other side of the yard, under a huge oak tree, was a large round enclosure made of slats of wood. The floor was covered in fresh straw and to one side were six or seven empty cages. This is where the dog sale will be, said Andrew confidently. They decided to leave before they were seen. On the way home, Annabelle and Andrew made a plan. They'd come back the following evening, just before the sale, and free the dogs. Then they'd all scamper back to the castle again and hide. That night, they didn't sleep at all. Instead, from the top of the castle, they gazed out to the stars and slowly watched the moon travel through the heavens. Every minute seemed like an hour. Eventually, the sun rose, but the day dragged on. It seemed like a year. 
Evening came. It's time to go now and we mustn't get caught, said Annabelle, shaking with fear. She'd not eaten all day. She was as white as a sheet and sick to the stomach. Lighting a candle, the nervous pair clambered down the spiral staircase, scrambled over the wooden barricade and out into the castle grounds. Rochester Cathedral towered against the night sky and some owls hooted as they flew past. See, I told you this place is haunted, wailed Annabelle, who promptly curled into a ball and lay on the damp grass trembling. Andrew was frightened too, but he didn't let on. No such thing as ghosts, utter rubbish. Never heard of anything like it. Come on, let's go, let's get going. Andrew could hear his heart thumping in his chest, but he wasn't telling Annabelle. He grabbed hold of Annabelle's arm and cautiously they made their way out of the castle grounds and along the lamp-lit cobbled street of Rochester High Street. They arrived at the Ball Hotel and they walked through its huge archway, past some carriages and made their way around to the back courtyard. Quietly, so not to be noticed, they stood in the shadow of the old stables. I can't see any dogs, whispered Annabelle softly, neither could Andrew. The cages that they'd seen previously were now filled with chickens and in the large wooden pen stood two goats and a sheep and a calf. Annabelle's face turned white with horror. Where were her dogs? Just then she heard voices. That's Mr and Mrs Featherstone, whispered Annabelle. Mr Featherstone, Mrs Featherstone, called Annabelle softly. Thankfully, Mr and Mrs Featherstone remembered her and they came to where both she and Andrew were standing. My name is Annabelle, I'm not really a boy. A bad man has stolen my puppies. Well, I mean my dogs. They have grown up now, sir, and I love them. Annabelle didn't come up for breath. I've named them Jan and Agatha after you and your wife. They are going to be sold here tonight. By the way, this is Andrew, my friend. Mr. Featherston spoke when Annabelle finally paused. They never have dog sales here, dear. Mr. Featherston said with concern, they have them at the Ball Tavern in Chatham. This is the Ball Hotel in Rochester. Oh dear, those poor young dogs. Andrew put his arms around Annabelle and she began to cry. I'm so sorry, I made a terrible mistake. He said I got the wrong bull. Anxiously, Mrs. Featherston asked, what time did the dog's house start? Nine o'clock, they answered simultaneously. Mr. Featherston took out his pocket watch. That's in five minutes. Poor Annabelle. She collapsed to the ground and cried. Don't worry, Mr. Featherston said optimistically. Dobbins parked outside and he gallops like the wind. We'll be there in no time at all. No sooner said and it was done. Everyone had piled into the cart and Dobbin took off like a rocket. The sound of galloping hooves on cobbled stones sounded like hail on a slate roof. On and on they galloped. Just two more minutes and we'll be there, said Mrs Featherston as she shouted. The sound of barking dogs could be heard from afar. We'll park here a short distance away. I'll do my best to get the dog, said Mr Featherston eagerly as he ran off into the darkness towards the ball tavern. Annabelle looked up to the sky. She studied the moon and she looked further into the heavens and time ticked by. I can see a pig, said Andrew as he pointed to the stars. No, maybe it's a hedgehog. No, it's actually a map of Australia, said Annabel indignantly. And she continued, I don't want to play that stupid, ridiculous game at a time like this. Time continued to tick by. Andrew strained his eyes into the darkness for any sign of the dogs and with Mr. Featherston. Eventually, the silhouette of a tall figure walked towards them. It was Mr. Featherston returning, but he was empty handed. Andrew hugged Annabelle. I'll get you some new dogs, love, he whispered solemnly. Annabelle started to cry. I don't want new dogs. I want my lovely Jan and Agatha, and I don't want them to be made into a pie and eaten. Annabelle cried and cried. She could hear the sound of dogs barking. No, don't worry, you won't have to replace them, reassured Mr. Featherston. They've been locked in the coal cellar beneath the tavern. They are safe for now. Oh, Annabelle shrieked with joy. 
She kissed everyone, including the horse. Get in the cart quickly, everyone, said Mr. Featherstone anxiously as he gathered up the reins. Dobbin must have heard, because once everyone was aboard, he galloped away in haste, and soon they were outside the tavern and the cart screeched to a halt. They all gazed at the small sooty window that was down at street level. Two tongues frantically licked at the dirty glass. It was Jan and Agatha. Mr. Featherstone bent down and wrenched the window open using a claw hammer he kept in his cart. Next thing, before Annabelle knew it, she was lying flat on her back on the cobble street, being licked to death by two maniac dogs. My beauties, my beauties, cried Annabelle. She struggled to catch her breath. Come on, let's get out of here quickly before anyone sees us, said Andrew anxiously. With that, everyone clambered into the cart that sped off in the direction of the river. Annabelle hugged the dogs closely. She was never going to let them go again. Soon they were parked in a paddock close to the river's edge at Rochester. This is where I first met you, Mr and Mrs Featherstone. And there, said Annabelle, pointing to the river, is where I found the puppies in the sack. The dogs quickly cowered down. They definitely were not not going out there in the river again. Please hold Dobbin for me, Andrew, Mr Featherstone said as he passed him the reins. Agatha and I need to unhitch the cart. Annabelle and Andrew stroked Dobbin's nose. Soon the dogs became jealous. They wanted their heads patted too. Give us your paw then, Agatha, said Annabelle, using her sweet sounding voice. Agatha wagged her tail and happily obliged. Both she and Andrew focused their attention on the two dogs. Dobbin became jealous and nuzzled them both firmly with his huge head. He almost knocked Annabelle over. You can't do tricks like they can, said Annabelle indignantly to the horse while struggling to her knees. Dobbin wasn't having any of it. Swiftly, he pushed them both again with his nose. All right then, said Annabelle, talking to the horse. You give me your paw. Surprisingly, Dobbin raised his knee and lifted his hoof off the ground. Look, look, shouted Annabelle. Give us your paw and wiggle your ear. Dobbin did that too. Okay, said Andrew, give me your other paw, wiggle your ears and swish your tail from left to right. The horse did exactly what he was asked to do. Now up and down, left to right, round and round again, Dobbin complied. Mr and Mrs Featherstone returned. I see you three have become acquainted then. Acquainted? Your horse is bewitched, said Andrew. Yes, indeed, replied Mr Featherstone. We put a spell on him about a month ago. Annabel was amazed at Mr Featherstone's reply. A spell? What do you mean by a spell, she asked. Are you witches or something? Mr Featherstone gently explained to the children that indeed Jan was a wizard and she, Agatha, was a wizardess. You can't be, said Annabel. Using a sweet sounding voice again, wizards live in castles, don't they? They do and we do. We live at Upna Castle. It's a few miles down river. Annabelle was full of questions for her newly confessed wizard and wizardess. You don't by chance have a tall pointed white hat with red stars on, do you? She asked. Sure do. Only wear it at home though, replied the wizard. See, I've got a magic walking stick too, he continued, as he waved the stick above the dog's heads. The questions kept coming. You don't by chance have a bright orange dress with white spots on, which you hang out to dry on a washing line that you strung from one cannon to the other, do you? Continued Annabel, talking to Agatha. Sure do, but I only wear it at home, Agatha replied. Andrew stood and listened with his mouth wide open. Are they all mad or what? It was nearly midnight and the full moon shone overhead. Dobbin was now grazing in a paddock and Jan and Agatha had walked along the nearby river bank and were just about to board their Thames barge for the journey home to Upner. Annabelle and Andrew and the two dogs stood close by. Are you coming with us? asked Agatha Featherstone. 
No, said Annabel. My mum said we are not allowed to go anywhere with strangers. Agatha was concerned. Well, where will you sleep tonight? asked Agatha, comfortingly. We live in a castle too, said Andrew confidently. We'll be all right. I'll take care of her. Agatha walked across and gave them a sack filled with goodies, plus some blankets. Jan had conjured them up using his magic powers. You can come and visit us at Upner Castle any time, he said. And with that, everyone waved goodbye. The children ran off and disappeared into the darkness. Home at Rochester Castle. Life went on. Annabel and Andrew lived at the top of Rochester Castle. The weeks passed by. Sometimes people came to visit the castle grounds and to feed the pigeons. Annabel and Andrew would peer down from the top. They would make up all sorts of stories like where the people had come from, whether they were rich or whether they were poor. And they would laugh while watching the pigeons settle on some unsuspecting person's head and poo. Mm. When the visitors had gone home, Annabel and Andrew would creep outside of the castle and search for scraps of food to use in his pigeon trap. Then each day he would build a fire in the grate at the top of the castle and roast pigeons three at a time on a spit. They were content with their lives. It was an early morning in November. The snow had arrived early that year and they had slept in each snuggled under their own pile of sacks next to the hot embers of yesterday's fire. The dogs had been out on their daily walk to the River Medway and were not yet home. Gotcha, screeched the old hag as she grabbed hold of Annabel by her hair. Got you too, growled Mr Ted as he grabbed hold of Andrew by the ear. You're not getting away this time. You're both off to the workhouse. Annabelle and Andrew kicked and scratched, but to no avail. In a very short time, they were bundled down the spiral staircase, across the snow-covered castle grounds, through a green door, and into one of the towers, the southern mural tower. It had been built in the wall of the castle. It was now used for storage. The tower had been sparsely furnished with two chairs and an old wooden table. Small individual piles of dried sweet corn lay on the table and a sign said, pigeon food, half a farthing a portion. Don't get any funny ideas, said the horrid Mr. Ted as he forced the children to sit on the chairs. There's no one around. You won't be getting any help from anyone. We'll be back to get you tonight and you will be going to the workhouse. With that, Mr. Ted and the old hag left, closing the thick green wooden door behind them. The key then turned in the lock. Annabelle and Andrew looked at each other in the half light. The blood had drained from their cheeks. Help, 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 they screamed simultaneously for about half an hour. Eventually, the dogs arrived and scratched at the door, but it was no use, they couldn't get in. Jan and Agatha called Annabel anxiously as she spoke to the dogs through the keyhole. Go and find Jan and Agatha Featherstone at the castle. Go now, be quick, go find, go find. The dogs thought it was all a game. They loved hide and seek. They bounded on the spot and leapt for joy in the snow. It was such fun. No, 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 go help, go help. Go find the wizard, the wizard, the wizard. It took some time for the dogs to understand what they were being told. Eventually the dogs had gone. Over Rochester Bridge they ran through the deep snow that lay around and onto the small town of Strood. Up Donkey's Mount, which was a steep snow-covered slope. They continued on past Frinsbury Church, then down the hill to Whitewall Creek. Downstream along the frozen river Medway mud flats, past some sandy cliffs, and then into the grounds of Upner Castle. The dogs barked and barked when they arrived. No one came running out. They ran around the back of the castle and the dogs came across an entrance to the old gunpowder tunnels that ran underneath the castle. They barked and barked. Hello, my darlings. What's all this then? Have you come to visit us? It was the wizard. He'd seen Jan and Agatha running down the snow-covered bank. Where's Annabel and Andrew? called the wizardess. She'd seen the dogs and was worried. 
the dogs began to hug and tug at Jan's long coat. Careful, mind you don't tear my coat, said Jan anxiously. The dog still tugged at the coat and the wizards repeated the question, where are they? The dog still tugged and tugged. Snow went everywhere, what a mess. Time for another magic spell, announced Jan, who now looked more like a snowman than a wizard. Where's my walking stick? Agatha handed Jan his stick. Here it is, dear. The wizard began his spell. From this day forth, with the rising and the setting of the sun, or when the moon awakens or goes to sleep, whether the tide is in or out in this country or any other, you, my sweeties, will always be able to understand the human voice forever. Coloured stars then filled the air. The wizard then put the stick down. Okay, now we've got that out of the way. Where are the kids? Are they at Rochester Castle? The dogs nodded. Agatha hitched Dobbin to his cart and they all climbed in and were ready to go. The rescue mission. Like the wind, Dobbin galloped across the top of the snow, out of the castle grounds. Inland they turned, travelling up the Upner Road, passing up the woods. On they raced alongside the tiny river Wayne, up the hill, past the old Tithe Barn, through Frunsby Churchyard, down Strood Hill, across Rochester Bridge, and on to Rochester Castle. Are they up in the castle keep? asked the wizard anxiously upon arrival at the castle grounds. The dogs shook their heads and scampered across to the tower in the curtain wall. Dobbin and the cart followed. Jan took out his magic walking stick, paused for a moment to think and then began to cast a spell. By eye of newt and song of thrush, with this wand I do thee cuss. With that the door caved in and broke into a thousand small pieces. Nicely done, nicely done, if I do say so myself, said Jan, as he clapped his hands in sheer delight. Everyone clapped, especially Annabel and Andrew, who were so pleased to see Mr Featherston and the dogs. Time for hugs, shouted Annabelle as she waded through the deep snow, heading for Mrs Featherston, who was standing by the cart. Annabelle hugged the wizardess. She was never going to let her go. A new beginning. Annabelle and Andrew decided to go and live in the gunpowder tunnels under Upner Castle, and life became fun. With Jan and Agatha the wizard and wizardess, plus Jan and Agatha the dogs, they enjoyed life to the full. For several years, they spent many enjoyable day walking downstream along the beach in the direction of a town called Who, and sailing alongside Chatham Dockyard and under Rochester Bridge. And sometimes they would go all the way through Rochester High Street and look in the shops. Annabelle loved art and continued with the help of Agatha. She had been an artist too. Together they spent many hours learning the craft of oil painting onto stretched canvas. The brick walls of the underground gunpowder tunnel became a beautiful art gallery. Annabelle had painted pictures of her life's memories, including living in the coal shed, finding the puppies, Rochester Castle and the Chatham Dockyard and many more fine works of art. People from the nearby town of Rochester and villages of Wainscot and Frinsbury, they came to visit the castle to view Annabelle's fine art exhibition and people paid to see her works. Annabelle saved all her money. When I go to Australia one day, said Annabelle, talking to Agatha, I'm going to take all these canvas paintings with me and I'm going to write a book all about my life and I'm going to be rich and famous. Agatha's practical comments brought Annabelle back to the present. Before you do that, Agatha said, there are the dishes to be washed in the river, plus you need to fish for tonight's dinner. And my dear, you haven't washed that dress for almost two weeks, hurry up. Annabelle washed the dishes and her dress. While gazing into the river, she fished and she started to set her goals. Time ticked by, and it soon was the day of Annabelle's 16th birthday. Everyone decided a picnic lunch at Upner River Beach would be a great way to celebrate. Lunch was enjoyed 
and soon all that remained was a few left over scraps. Come on, Jan, said Annabelle, talking to the wizard. Let's go over there and feed the gulls at the docks. Annabelle had an ulterior motive. Slowly, they ambled across to the moored ship and fed the gulls. You know, said Annabelle politely, it's my 16th birthday. Could you please, please grant me some magical wishes? Jan raised an eyebrow, scratched his head and took a deep breath. What is it that you'd like, he asked with curiosity, because Annabelle had had birthday wishes before. Well, there are four things, and she paused, well, five things actually. The first is, can you make it so I never have to wash dishes or clothes ever again, so long as I live? It is my birthday. No. Okay, the second is, can I please call you both mum and dad? Everything went quiet. The wizard sat on an old barrel to catch his breath, and then he began to cry. Come here, Agatha, called Jan the wizard as he wiped his nose onto a freshly laundered handkerchief and beckoned to Agatha with his hand. Two Agathas eventually arrived. No, not you, my sweet, he said, Jan talking to the dog. I mean you, my darling wife, Agatha. Annabelle asked Agatha the same question that she just asked Jan, and Agatha cried too. Of course you can, they both said simultaneously. Never had two such happy people ever been seen. Well, what's your third wish, asked Jan. Annabelle had been planning this request for quite some time. Please, can you put shapes on my dog's fur to resemble the map of Australia and make it that the dogs can smell nicely, like mint, and that when they have puppies and their puppies have puppies and their puppies' puppies have puppies, they will always have these marks of Australia on them forever and ever and smell like mint forever and ever too. Please... The wizard scratched his head. He'd never heard such a request before. Luckily, because he was a wizard and he had magic powers, he could conjure up the map of Australia quite easily. Do you still want the spell so that they can understand the humans too? Annabelle politely replied, yes, please, if possible. Jan looked around and asked, has anyone seen my magic walking stick? Here it is, replied Agatha. Agatha always kept the stick close at hand. By eye of newt and legs of frogs, I now put spells on these two dogs. Australian maps it shall be, onto mint-smelling dogs I do put with glee. Jan Agatha dogs forever they will always be. Jan waved the magic walking stick and a trail of coloured stars filled the air. It's done. Jan and Agatha stood there wagging their tails. Each had an Australian map on both sides of their bodies and they smelt like mint. Totally beautiful, said Annabelle excitedly as she sniffed the air. Jan Agatha dogs, how beautiful. There is just one thing though, continued Annabelle. My dogs have never had puppies. Do you know why that is? The wizard confessed that he'd put a spell on the dogs that night when they'd been playing at shaking hands with the horse. I didn't want you to have all that trouble with all those puppies, he said. I'll take the spell off, if you like. Annabelle nodded and smiled. She had visions of cute puppies and each with its own map of Australia. By now, some children had gathered around and were patting the dogs. What a magical wonder they were. What other wishes do you have? inquired the wizard. Annabelle opened her bag and took out the treasured chalk fossils that her mum and dad had given her all those years ago. Tears filled her eyes. Holding her hand up to the wizard's ear, she whispered softly. The wizard took hold of the magic walking stick and whispered some words and coloured stars filled the air. What was all that about? asked Andrew with curiosity. Oh, it's going to be a surprise. It's to do with my chalks and my paints. It will be so magical. I'll tell you later, replied Annabelle. I'm so excited. I can't wait to see how it works. The wizard inquired about Annabelle's final wish. Okay, our final wish, said Annabelle, who by now was holding Andrew's hand, 
is that we all sail to Australia. Please, please, will you both come with us? The wizard was totally shocked and had to sit down. Agatha held his hand. She was shocked too. Are you mad? Continued the wizard. Do you know what it's like living down under? There are not many buildings. There are definitely no castles. It's very hot. There isn't much food and it's not going to be the right place for a young lady at all. Annabelle pleaded, I've always wanted to go. My mum and dad said I could go there one day. I wanted to see all those cuddly bears that live in trees and jumping animals with big tails. You mean koalas and kangaroos, don't you, replied the wizard. Kanga what, said Annabelle. Jan turned to Andrew and Agatha. Well, do you want to go too, to see the roos? They nodded. Australia it is then, announced the wizard. Will we go by ship or will I cast a spell? Well, I'll have to think about that one, they all replied simultaneously. Well, let's go home to the castle then, shouted Annabelle, as she squealed with delight and jumped high into the air, waving her arms. There are plans to make. Come on, let's go. Night fell over the castle and the excitement filled the air. Annabelle was tucked up securely in bed and her curtains were closed. Not everything in Annabelle's world had changed. She still liked to decorate her own room. A beautiful mural stretched around all four walls. There were pictures of frogs eating pigs, toads wearing clothes, ships on the high seas, castles, horses, koalas, kangaroos, and Janakatha dogs. Slowly, the light faded and the long evening shadows stretched across the floor. Night, Mum. Night, Dad. Love you. Night, night, replied the wizard and the wizardess. Have you checked for spiders, asked Andrew. No spiders here, said Annabelle confidently. That's the benefit of having your own wizard. No spiders in the bedroom ever. See you in the morning. That's the end for now. I do hope you enjoyed the film. It was a lot of fun, wasn't it? This is the book. So I've got two other books as well. So, um, that follow on from this one. So if you'd like to read a continuation of the story, um, you can purchase them by going to janetskinner.com. Thank you so much for watching.